Hello to all. This is Minister Leonard Harris, and again, it is a pleasure and an honor to share the Word of God with you, our listeners, to our Pleasant Green Church family, and to those that are listening online. Um, we just want to say we pray God's blessings upon you and that we would like, uh, we appreciate your joining in with us uh, to indulge into the Word of God. And we hope, and it is our prayer, that something in the lesson will be fruitful and beneficial to the listeners and that it will assist us and accommodate us in whatever experiences that the Lord has placed before us. Now today's lesson is Lesson 6 out of Unit 2 titled Called to Praise God. And today's lesson in particular is Ball of Confusion. Uh, as we look at many of the circumstances in and throughout the world today, it is an appropriate title, Ball of Confusion. Our devotional reading is Deuteronomy, the 10th chapter, verses 17 through 21. A background scripture is Psalms number 9, and then Ecclesiastes, the third chapter, verses 16 through 22. And then our printed passage is the number 9 of Psalms, verses 1 through 12. And our key verse is Psalms number 9, verse 8, and it reads, He rules the world in righteousness and judges the people with equity. He rules the world in righteousness. And I read the NIV, but I like the wording of the King James in the second segment of the verse, which says, instead of judges the people with equity, it says, he shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness. And just that turn on the use of words in itself expresses and explains the Spirit of God in righteousness and judgment rather than and judges the people with equity. He shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness. Now our lesson's aims are contrast God's judgment with humanity's injustices. Value how God listens and responds to our needs. Practice God's justice in difficult situations. Now the different parts of our lesson. First part is praise God for his justice. Verses 1 through 4. And then praise God for his righteousness. Verses 5 through 8. 
and then praise God for his memory. Verses 9 through 12. So uh, we have uh, three full parts of our lesson uh, to address. And what our prayer is, is that as we indulge, the Spirit of God will give utterance and clarity uh, that we may better understand the presence of God in times of confusion and times of calamities in times of distress that we may come to understand and to better connect to the spiritual presence of God in God's righteousness and judgment. And we ask this upon the Spirit of God in the name of Christ and for His sake we ask it. Although our lesson is entitled Ball of Confusion, our three sections of our lesson is entitled Praise. Praise God for what? For God's justice, for God's righteousness, and for God's memory. So although the lesson the title of the lesson uh, somehow entertains disarray or disturbance, uh, confusion. But the contrast of it is that the segments of the lesson say in the midst of this ball of confusion, Praise God for God's justice, righteousness, and memory. And as we continue into the lesson, I think one of the things that we should identify, uh, starting at the beginning of our lesson's aims, uh, contrast God's justice with humanity's injustices. That is, the injustices that we face in the world predicated by humans. When we think of the strife, when we think of the trouble, when we think of the disturbances, and the disconnection, the division, and such. When we look at the practices of governments, when we look at the behavior and attitude of people as individuals and then collectively as groups and nations, pitted one against another. These are the acts of humans and not of God. But many times in the consequences of our own actions as personal individuals first, and then collectively as groups, and then as communities, and then as 
statehood, and nations. When we look over the whole picture, much of what we suffer is not at the hands of God, but it's at the hands of ourselves. On individual behavioral patterns, all the way to nation and world calamities. And so, when we look at the title saying, Praise God for Justice, Righteousness, and Memory, we understand through commentary that uh, David in Psalms 9 and 10, uh, it has been stated that David was praising God for uh, God's triumph in enabling Israel and David to overcome the Philistines. And we know about the defeat by David over Goliath. And so when we think of these, uh, leading up to this time, the Philistines had been slaughtering the Israel, the Hebrew nation. The Philistines had been conquering them and uh, had been um, shaming Israel, uh, mocking Israel. Uh, saying that uh, they have the most powerful God and yet look at their condition. And so after suffering through this and then becoming triumph over their strongest warrior, being defeated by a young man, a young boy, David, and then God's presence manifesting itself out of the belief of David that his God was greater than the Philistines and Goliath. And because God manifested the power of God, David fell into praise to thank God for being just. Our first section opens up with praise for God for his justice. And so here uh, David acknowledges verses 1 and 2 by saying that I will give thanks to the Lord with all of my heart. I will tell and show forth all of his marvelous works. I will sing praise to his name, the God of the Most High. And then he discusses how God had turned his enemies back and they fell and perished at his presence. So David says and and expounds uh, upon and and verbalizes that I'm not going to wait for someone else to begin the praise, but just on what I have experienced, I'm going to engage and I'm going to go into praise simply because of what I personally know God has done on my behalf. I don't have to wait for it to be a collective experience or for others to join in with me, but just because of my experience and what I have encountered, what I have been a beneficiary of because of God interceding in and on my behalf then I will open my own mouth to utter praise to God for being just. Um, now, uh, 
one of the things that uh, I, I think we should uh, give attention to is, is that while there are all types of forms of uh, dis, distorted uh, situations in the world today, I think about uh, the people of Afghanistan who we recently have been informed and seeing the people uh, trying on the, the at the airport to become free and, and, and free from the retaliation they would experience when the American troops left. I, we recently also have seen, uh, based up on the calamities that took place in Haiti and how so many Haitians are just totally without things that many of us uh, have a uh, abundance of, or maybe we don't have an abundance, but we have a repetition of it. We have place to stay, we have food to eat, we have water and beverages to drink, we have a shelter, we have a home, uh, we have clothing, uh, we have employment, uh, we're not worried about what may come tomorrow, but we are living in times where some things that uh, may come across to those who are the recipients of it and been the recipients of the goodness of God for so long until it's almost viewed as it is fundamental. It's basic. Um, these things uh, I have without question. And yet there are millions of people in the world today that don't have those things that we sometimes take for granted. And as we continue to look at the news and see on the West Coast, we have uncontrollable fires that with all of the knowledge and experience of our firefighter, firefighters knowing how to contain and bring fires under control, they have not been successful. And then we see the forces of nature and still people recovering uh, in New Orleans and down south. Uh, and then drought in other parts of the land. Farmers are not able to yield pro, uh, produce and such from the land that they have. We are experiencing ex different situations that many of us have not gone through a period of time where so many different types of strife have all been present at the same time. But I still want us to recognize that while all of these things are present, that it uh to show contrast here uh it was said that famine is of nature but starvation is of man because the abundance of god the cattle on a thousand hills still belongs to God. The abundance of God is still present when famine takes place in different parts of the earth. But the starvation is because of man. Famine is because of nature. And so what I want us to understand is, is that while all of these other conditions are present, the deliverance of God is still available. The patience of God is still here. The forgiveness of God 
is still available. The deliverance, the salvation of God, the long-suffering of God, the counsel of God, the justice of God, the kindness of God, the uh, preservation and the restoration of God, the Spirit of God is still present when all of the conditions of man have surfaced, yet all of the love of God, the acceptance of God, the salvation of God, all of the things and attributes and manifestations of God are still present when the conditions and consequences of man have surfaced. Now, we want to uh, uh, read uh, just a, uh, a word um, out of the 37th number of Psalm, um, uh, just to give reassurance again, uh, and we speak about praising God for justice, righteousness, and memory. And then, uh, let's be mindful of this as well. Uh, there are only uh, two times uh, to praise God, and that is when we feel like it and when we don't. Uh, sometimes we say there's only two times to worship God, and that's when you feel like it and when you don't. Because God doesn't have a hot and cold. God is the same today, yesterday, tomorrow, and forever. So all that God is, is always available to us. Now, let's uh, uh, read what it says in the 37th number of Psalms. And I'm just going to read uh, just a few verses, starting uh, at number 7. And it says, Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way. Because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. A lot of times we give too much credence and too much recognition to the evil. Uh, rather than looking beyond the evil and seeing the good of God. But it tells us don't waste a whole lot of time worrying about those that appear to be prospering uh, because they have these wicked schemes that they plan to continue to uh, take advantage of and oppress those that are weak or those that are without. It says, don't worry about that. Why? It says, focus your attention on this. It says, cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only causes harm. And we have a lot of people that are suffering from mental illnesses today. And certainly this is not uh, the diagnosis of every case. But a lot of people are under distress today because... Our focus is on things that harm us internally. And so some of the anger that we harbor for certain situations or for certain people, if we would release that and let life and God handle it, we would free ourselves from the stress we find ourselves under. Let us go on though. It says, because evildoers shall be cut off 
But those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. Now, I don't want us to mistake in this and um, it come across as though we just sit back, do nothing, and just wait. And then uh, abundance is just going to fall out of the sky. But here, when we say inherit the earth, it's saying that those are just, that those that are have a relationship with the Lord, that they are patiently waiting on the Lord's righteousness and justice to intervene. They shall inherit the earth. And let us go on. It says, for yet a little while and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place. You will try to find where are they at now. I know they're hiding. I know they're waiting to emerge and then cause uh, havoc again. But it says, you will look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. But the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. The wicked plots against the just and gnashes at him with his teeth. The Lord <laughs> laughs at him, for he sees that his day is coming, and the wicked have drawn the sword and have bent their bow to cast down the poor and the needy to slay those who are upright in conduct. Their sword shall either, I mean, their sword shall enter their own heart and their bows shall be broken. A little that a righteous man has is better than the riches of many wicked. So when we see these types of conditions that we are experiencing and seeing throughout the world, we have to understand that many times that uh, governments that come into power, they bring these calamities and these conditions of unrest and rebellion, they bring it about by the actions of their own wickedness and hearts. And what, what causes the contrast is, is that the judgment of God is present exposing the wickedness of the wicked. And as people are brought into the light of God, the understanding of God, they begin to withdraw from the practice and the continuation of oppression and strife. And when the wicked begin to see the lack of their control and their a constant grip upon the masses and then righteousness is lifted as a banner against wickedness and people begin to be drawn to the spirit of God then we begin to see the rebellion against the wicked to release and return unto God what is God's now, when we look at the second part that talks about righteousness, it says, you have rebuked, rebuked the heathen in the NIV. It says the nations and destroyed the wicked. Why is this titled praise God for his righteousness? Because 
God has brought the consequences of the heathens and the wicked nations upon themselves and says he is destroying the wicked. He has blotted out their name forever and ever. Endless ruins have overtaken my enemies. Endless ruin has overtaken my enemies. The King James says, Thou enemy destructions are come to a perpetual end. And it continues and says, You have uprooted their cities, even the memory of them has perished. And we know that through history, there have been rise and falls of great rulerships. They have come and they have gone, but God is still the same. God doesn't have a roller coaster presence. God doesn't come and at some point God is riding high, but then at other periods of time, God is on the downside of the roller coaster. No, no, no. Man, rulerships, governments, principalities, those come and go. But God is above all rulerships, all dominions, all governments, all principalities. And so we cannot equate or match uh, or God as though God is somewhat like the experiences of life and the consequences thereof. Now, as we look at the closing of our lesson, it says, the Lord will be our refuge for the oppressed. A refuge in times of trouble. And they that know the, thy name will put their trust in thee. For thou, Lord, has not forsaken them that seek thee. Now, I want to just uh, read uh, this passage. And uh, uh, this is out of First Peter, and it is the third chapter. First Peter, and the third chapter, I'm going to begin it at the eighth verse. And I, I wanted to read this here because... Uh, and the last part of our lesson says, praise God for his memory. And then it, it speaks about uh, the Lord is our refuge for the oppressed and our stronghold in times of trouble. Uh, he will avenge uh, the blood, remember, uh, for he who re avenges blood remembers. He does not ignore the cries of the afflicted. And I need to read that again. For he who avenges blood remembers. He does not ignore the cries of the afflicted. And since the Lord has proclaimed in his word that Revenge is mine, said the Lord, I shall repay. In the course of that, I want us to be mindful of what our behavior, our mindset, our conduct, our likeness is. And this is uh, what it says again this is the first 
uh, 1 Peter, the third chapter, uh, beginning at verse 8. It says, finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers and sisters. Be tender hearted. Be courteous. Not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling. For reveling or for reveling. But on the contrary, blessings, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. But on the contrary, blessings, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing for he who would love life and see good days let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit let him turn away from evil and do good let him seek peace and pursue it for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. And the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. I thought that in the course of us acknowledging that we ought praise God for God's memory that God is aware of the wickedness of the wicked and has not ignored it nor forgotten it but in the process of that let us be mindful of what is required of us by the same God that avenges the unjust and the wicked. Let us be mindful what is seeking of us as followers and believers. We hope that something was shared, uh, something was lifted uh, that brings understanding uh, gives us uh, an insight into what God is saying to us in this day and in this time. And in your leisure, in your leisure, I would recommend that um, if you could just... Uh, Access the words of the song, Ball of Confusion, sang by one of the probably most profound men's group of our time. But I don't lift it to bring recognition to the group. I lift it to look at the words of the song some 50 years ago and just listen or just read i just printed the words off the lyrics off of the song online and if we would just look at the wording while many think we have advanced and we're going forward and we're into an age of electronics and robotics and social media and now we all have computers in our pockets in the means of cell phones but we we must look at human behavior and not confuse automation and technology 
with also being uh, connected with advancement in humanity. Definitely not in the human spiritual advancement. So in your leisure, just look at the wording spoken of in song, in format, 50 years ago. And then equate it to what we are still doing today, why some think we have advanced. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer. <laughs>